Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to another Words of Wisdom Bible Study. I thank you so much for joining in. I know that we missed last week, amen, but we're here this week, glory to God. God is an amazing God. He is an awesome, awesome, awesome God. Hallelujah. I wouldn't trade him for the world. So as I always do, as I encourage you to get out your Bible, get out paper and pencil, hallelujah, but most importantly, get out your sword, get out the word of God, amen, your love letter from your heavenly father, hallelujah, and I have my iPad out, but I also have my paper Bible, just in case the technology wants to act crazy, I have my paper Bible as well, so as we always do, as we hold up our Bible and we make the declaration to ourselves, and we make the declaration to the spiritual realm that this is my Bible, this is my sword, this is my word from my heavenly father. And I have what he says I have. I can do what he says I can do. Tonight I will be taught the word of God. I boldly confess my mind is alert and my heart is receptive and I will never be the same. Never, 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 never be the same in Jesus name. Amen. To God be all glory, honor, and praise. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So I want you to uh, turn to 1 Corinthians. We're going to go on um, in the sequential um, order as the as it is laid out in the Bible. Even though the letter of 1 Corinthians does not actually come after Romans, we're going to go ahead and, 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 and follow the sequential order of the Bible. So 1 Corinthians is where we're going to be tonight. So turn to 1 Corinthians, it's a book right after Romans. So we're going to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version, and 1 Corinthians chapter 1, New King James Version, I'm going to read a few verses, and then I'm going to go back and expound on it, and this is what it says, hallelujah, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all who are in every place, called on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God, which was given to you by Jesus Christ, by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. And who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So I just read 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I read verses um, 1 through 9. So for you who just joined in, we're at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And in this particular letter... Paul is beginning to address some of the divisions in the church. And these divisions are still happening in the church nowadays. So because Paul would travel around, him and his mission, missionary team, they would travel around to different cities. And when they would go to a particular city, into a city, spreading the gospel, they would also establish churches in those cities. Now, this particular church, the church at Corinth, before um, Paul, when Paul wrote this letter, it had already been established for about four or five years. And this particular letter was written, um, Paul established this church in his third, on his third missionary journey or his third missionary trip that he had made. So the task that Paul is tackling in this letter, he's trying to keep and get the world out of the people and keep them from falling back into the a legalistic ag attitude to the paganistic attitude because in the town of Corinth there were so many temples in the town 
that were dedicated to the goddess Aphrodite, and she was the goddess of sexuality. So in these temples, there were thousands of priestesses or prostitutes that were in these temples. So these people that have now become believers in Christ Jesus have now repented of their sin. They were still surrounded by this type of immorality and this type of wickedness. They were still surrounded by this and they grew up in this society. So growing up in this society, they had the mindset that they had to adhere by certain laws or certain formulas in order to have the mindset that they had, in order to have the knowledge that they had, they depended on the worldly system and the knowledge that the world had given them or that they had acquired through the world. They were dependent on the societal thinking that they grew up in. So Paul is trying to minister to them by letter and trying to get this type of thinking and division out of the church. These Corinthian people, they depended on the intellectualism and the knowledge of the world. So they were still, some of them were still trying to operate in this fashion or in this way. So some of the church's problems that we're going to um, encounter in this particular uh, chapter, we're going to encounter that they were trying to say because they had spiritual mentors, many of them were saying that we are of this person or we are of this person, but they were not focusing on Christ Jesus, which we know that we must focus and keep our focus and attention on Christ Jesus. So Paul had received two different notifications, two different letters from uh, that problems were happening in the church of Corinth. So one of the letters came from the house of Chloe and the other was delivered and came from Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaeus. So in verse one of first Corinthians chapter one, it says, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sothenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all who are in every place, call on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul often starts his letter out by introducing himself and telling them why he's qualified to say the things that are going to follow after. So he's letting the people know that I'm called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. And he's letting them know that I wasn't called by man, but I was called by and through the will of God. And then he tells them that Sotheny's our brother. He says he's also sending a greeting. He says to the church of God, which is at Corinth. So he's making sure that they know that this is to the church of God. This is not to the temple of Aphrodite. This is not to the wicked temple. This is to the church of God, which is at Corinth. So to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, that means those who have been set apart, those who God has handpicked and hand selected to serve Christ Jesus, to be in the body of Christ, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, he said, call to be saints. So he said, you've been called and you've been set up, sanctified and you've been set apart by God. And this type of, of call requires us as individuals to make daily changes so that we can see what God sees. See, God already sees what we will be in the end. He already sees the end. He sees the beginning and he sees the end. He sees everything in the middle, but he knows what we shall become. But in order for us to see what we shall become, we have to constantly sanctify ourselves. That means getting into God's word and allow God's word to push the dirt the sin, the inconsistencies, push all of that mess out of our life. And that only comes by consecrating ourselves and dedicating ourselves to God and to the will of God. So God sees what we shall become. And our daily walk brings the sanctification that we can be able to see that sanctification as saints by our daily walk. 
And he said, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and, and, and ours. He says, grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that grace and peace can only come from God, our Father. It can only come from God, our Father, through the Lord Jesus Christ. Many people think that they have peace, but it's not true peace because true peace only can come from the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the peace that is perfect. That is the peace that says that even though all hell may be breaking loose around you, that you can remain confident knowing that God is still in control. You can remain, you can rest assured that God has everything under control, that he's still on his throne and that he is never, ever going to lose control of the world. So as Paul is saying in these verses, he begins to praise them. He's he's going to begin to praise these praise these people, the, the people at Corinth, the saints. He's going to praise them before he begins to correct them or before he begins to chastise them. And oftentimes when a leader is going to chastise somebody or correct them, they don't come the way Paul is coming. They don't know or that don't seem to be able to apply or don't care to apply that before you chastise someone, before you correct someone, you should allow the spirit of the living God to tell them what they are doing correctly or to thank God that they are in the body of Christ or to thank God for the gifts that God has put in them. So he's going to uh, affirm their privileges for being in God's family and what God has already accomplished in and through them. So in verse four, Paul says, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God, which was given to you by Jesus Christ. So Paul is saying, I thank God always concerning you. He says, I thank God for you and for the grace that he has given you by and through Christ Jesus. And then in verse five, he says that you are enriched in everything by him. So he's letting them know. He says, you are enriched in everything by the Lord Jesus Christ and all utterance and all speech, in other words, and all knowledge. So Paul is saying that God has improved or he has enhanced your ability and value as an individual. He said he's made, he's got his hand on your whole life. He's made you wealthier, wealthier in everything, not just financial wealth, but he's talking about spiritually being spiritually wealthy because before we become come to Jesus, we are spiritually dead. Yes, we are alive physically, but on the inside, the one that really counts before we come to Jesus and ask him to be our Lord and Savior, repent of our sins, that man on the inside is dead. He is spiritually dead. We are actually, before we get saved, we're actually, we were actually walking dead people. And those who have not received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they are walking dead people. They're like zombies. We see them moving around, but if we had x-ray vision and could see in the spirit, we will see that they are actually dead on the inside. They are black on the inside. So he says that you were enriched, that you were improved or enhanced, that God improved or enhanced your ability and value in everything by him, saying that he is the one that's in control. He is the one that's doing all these things. And then he said in all utterance or speech and all knowledge, that's knowledge that pertains to uh, the scripture, knowledge that pertains to the Lord Jesus Christ. So even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, he says, because he, Paul has already declared to them that what Christ was going to do in and through them. So he said, it's been confirmed. That means they've seen it. They've been able to actually see what Paul was talking about. Christ has brought it to pass. He's shown them that he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above anything that they can ask or think. So Paul says in verse six, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you so that you come short in no gift. That means they were gifted. God gave them all types of spiritual gifts. They were not short in any spiritual gift. He says, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he says he's confirmed you. He will confirm you to the end as long as we hold on to the hope, as long as we hold on to our salvation, as long as we keep our hands in the hands of the Lord, as long as we keep our eyes on the Lord and we endure to the very end of our lifespan, we will be able to experience everything that he's talking about. We will be able to experience what he is talking about now. He's going to confirm it to the very end, but we've got to hold on. See, he's given you and he's given me and he's given every human the free will to be able to choose whether they want to continue to follow the Lord or whether they want to go back out into the world. He's given us all a free will, whether we want to receive him as Jesus Christ and Lord and Savior, repent of our sins, or whether we want to reject him. So we all have a free will. He is never going to violate our will because that is what he's given to us as our freedom to be able to choose. So he says that you may be blameless to the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So if we hold on to the very end, we will be blameless. All those sins will be cast away forever. We will never have to worry about sin, sickness, or any of those things. So he said you will be blameless. That refers to our standing in Christ through faith and not our work. So he's telling them they're going to be blameless. He says, not based on your work. It's not based on your intellectual ability. It's not based on your knowledge. It's not based on your strength, but it is based on your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Then in verse nine, he says, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So Paul is is reminding them that God is faithful. You've already seen what he's already been doing in you and through you. God is faithful. He says, by whom you were called into this fellowship of his son, uh, Jesus Christ, our Lord. He's letting them know that God is the one who called you into this fellowship. So God has the ability not just to call you, but also to keep you if you want to be kept. He has the ability to keep you and sustain you, to strengthen you, to be able to endure to the very end. So God always does what he says. He always does what he says. And when he invited us into his family, into his kingdom, he's able to make sure that we have everything that we will ever need. He's able to make sure that we have, we will have the ability to be able to stand in him and through him by his, by the power of his Holy Spirit. So we have to understand that God will do just what he says he will do. He will never renege on his word. Then in verse 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10 says this. Now I, my play paper's trying to fly away. Now I plead with you. This is Paul still talking. He says, I plead with you, brethren, and don't get tripped up on brethren. He's talking to us sisters also. So he says, now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all, that it's excluding no one, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So Paul is pleading with the church, and even though this is directed to the church in Corinth, he's pleading with us as the body of Christ. You're in the, if you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he is pleading with you as the church. You are the church of the living God. So he says, stop arguing with each other. This is what he says. Stop arguing with each other. Then he says, walk, walk in harmony. He wants us to walk in harmony so that there won't be any splits. There won't be any divisions. There won't be any clicks in the church. How many know that there are clicks in the church? If you don't look like me, or if you don't dress like me, or if you don't have the same amount of education as me, this is people talking, then you can't be in this clique that sits on the west side of the church or you can't be in this clique that sits together in the south side of the church or whatever side you can't be in this clique if you don't pass our test that's basically what people are saying when they have these cliques if you don't believe the same thing as me if you don't walk or live the same places where i live or can do what i can do then you're not going to be part of the clique so 
Paul is saying, we, I want you to walk in harmony. So there's no splits. There's no division. There's no clicks in the church. Then he says, I want you to speak the same thing and have unity. That means to be unified in the spirit of truth. That means have the unity of heart. That means we have to get into God's word, read and study God's word. Let God help us apply it to our lives. We have to walk in the spirit so we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the spirit so we won't be saying things that are going to be hurtful to other people and derogatory things to other people. So he said he wants us to be perfectly joined together with one mind. We need to have the mind of Christ. What is the mind of Christ? The mind of Christ has the power to to make you totally free. That is a power to think about those things on an honest, true, and of a good report. See, if we don't allow the mind of Christ to be in us, our mind has the power to paralyze us. It has a, a, the power to keep us from being motivated, or it has the power to motivate us. It has the power to send us into deep despair, or it has the power to cause us to celebrate. So it's up to each individual how we want to use our minds and how how and, and how we want to operate. So we have to operate in the spirit of the living God so that we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh, so that we won't have that stinking thinking, so that our minds will stay on Christ. Because he said, if you keep your mind stayed on me, I will keep you in perfect peace. That means if we keep our focus on Jesus Christ, he knows that we're not going to think about him 24 hours out of the day but for the majority of the day everything we do if we dedicate our lives and our actions to him then that means that our minds is focused on him because we want to make sure that what we do pleases him so he said to set our minds on things above in colossians chapter 3 verses 2 through 10 if you write that down colossians chapter 3 Colossians chapter 3, verses 2 through 10. See, the instruction that he's given us is to not set our minds on earthly things. Don't set our mind on how to gain more influence, not to set our minds on how to gain more wealth, not to set our minds on how to um, be established in society so that people will worship us. He said, don't set your mind on those earthly things. See, that's what the world is doing. The world is setting their mind on how to get more money in the bank or how to gain more influences or how to become a celebrity or how to become the greatest singer. That's what the world is thinking about. They're not thinking about how to please God. They're not thinking about how um, to walk in newness of life and and to allow Jesus to change their mindset. They're not thinking about that. They're not thinking about having their, their heart set on the Lord. So we don't want to be influenced and pressured by worldly ways. So that's why Paul is saying, stop arguing, walk in harmony, speak the same things, be perfect, perfectly joined with one mind, to have the mind of Christ, to set your mind on things above. So even though we're living in a paganistic society, because we see all the different religions, there's hundreds and thousands of different religions that are all around us, but we don't want to follow after them. We want to follow hard after Christ. We don't want the world to get into us, and we want to keep the world out of the church. But it's sad to say the world has infiltrated so many churches now that the churches are thinking that what is good is evil and what is evil is good. And they've come so far away from the message of the word, the message of the cross, salvation. They've come so far away from that. And what is even sadder is that people are actually sitting in these churches, listening to all this garbage, taking all of this in, being infiltrated and oppressed by these spirits and lied to by these spirits. And they've been lied to so long, they don't even see what the truth is. They think that the leader that is ministering to them or preaching to them is giving them the unadulterated word because they fail to get in to the word themselves and that has to be a sin not to be getting into God's word and find out for yourself what he's saying because when they stand before God they cannot say they won't have a room to a leg to stand on to say well I thought it was right because God is going to say I gave you my word. I left my word to you. Why did you not get in the word yourself and read it for yourself? He's going to tell them, I was warning you. I was trying to pull you out of there, but you refused to follow my lead. Then in verse 11 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it says, For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, 
by those of Chloe's household that there are contentions, which means there's arguments, there's disputes, there's conflicts, there's disagreements among you. So I, what I liked about Paul is Paul didn't deal with rumors or secrecy. He didn't go and say, well, I heard. He told them exactly where it came from. He said, it came from Chloe's household that there's contentions, there's arguments and disputes and conflicts and disagreements among you. So he went straight, gave them the source. It was Chloe's household. And then in verse 12, he says, now I say this, that each of you says, I am Paul, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos or I am of Cephas, which is also named Peter, or I am of Christ. So these people were saying that their spiritual mentors, the people that the person they looked up to, they're saying that I am of this person. But we need to keep our eyes focused on the Lord. So many times people get so tripped up that they think they put their pastor or their leader or their apostle or their bishop up on such a high pedestal. They're focusing on them instead of focusing on Christ. They've lost their love for Christ. They've lost the vision of Christ. We should not put no human on a pedestal where Christ is supposed to be. So he said, you these arguments, these disagreements over who you are following. See, as true blood brought believers, we are all supposed to be following Christ and not an individual, regardless of their title, regardless of uh, how much money they have, regardless of any of those things. Those things are irrelevant in comparison to Christ. Christ is the one that should be on the throne of our heart. He's the one that should be on our mind. He's the one that we should be trying to please and everything else will fall into place. See, because these people with these titles, they did not purchase our salvation. They didn't purchase your salvation and they didn't purchase mine. So we should not have them up on a pedestal. And these divisions that we are reading about in 1 Corinthians, these are divisions that are in the church today. Many believers are exalting their human leaders or even themselves. They're exalting themselves and human leaders over top Christ and it should not be. Christ, God said, I will not share my glory with anybody. Then in verse 13, Paul addresses what was happening, what they were saying. I am of Paul, I'm of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. So Paul is, is addressing that in 13, because he says, I heard you said this in verse 12, but he said, this is what he's asking them in 13, so that they can examine them own selves. He says, is Christ divided? So he's telling them, think about this. Is Christ divided? He says, was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? See, Paul has heard these things and heard that this is what Chloe's household is saying is happening. So he's asking them, is Christ divided? Did I, Paul, die for your sins? And were any of you baptized in my name? He said, I didn't die for you, so... I will not baptize you in my name. He says, if anyone baptized you in their name, they were wrong. They were in error. That was a sin. So he said, is Christ divided? No, Christ is not divided. And then Paul said, did I, Paul, die for your sins? Paul did not die for their sins. So he's asking him, so if I didn't die for your sins, if Apollos didn't die for your sins, if Cephas, a.k.a. Peter, if they didn't die for your sins, then why, why are you saying you are of these people that did not die for your sins, did not give you salvation, did not give you eternal life. Then in verse 14, he says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. So Paul is saying, right now, I'm very thankful that I didn't baptize anyone except for Crispus and Gaius. And later on, we're going to see where he baptized Stephanus. But he says, I'm thankful that I didn't baptize anyone but Crispus and Gaius. And he says, because I don't want you to be saying that I'm trying to start something new, that I'm trying to start something under my name. So these Corinthians had identified themselves with their spiritual mentors rather than with Christ. 
So verse 15, Paul says, unless anyone should say that I baptize in my own name. So he says, because I didn't baptize any of y'all, you can't say that I baptized you in the name of Paul. He says, because later on, we're going to see that Paul tells them that he came to preach the gospel. And that's what his calling is and not necessarily to be baptized. And so then in verse 16, he says, yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus because I do not know whether I baptized any other. So Paul is declaring that not only did he baptize Crispus and Gaius that he said in verse 14, but he says, I also baptized Stephanus and Stephanus was his first convert in Achaia. So make sure, I want to encourage you to make sure that your pastor or teacher or the preacher or the leadership is helping you to learn about Christ and not trying to bring themselves glory. It's not trying to put themselves on a pedestal, but I want you to make sure, make sure that whoever you're sitting under, wherever you're going, that they're not trying to bring themselves glory. Then in verse 17, it says, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. So he's letting us know, he said, Christ didn't send me to baptize. And I know that uh, Jesus said that that's one of the things that we are to do is to baptize. But we also got to know and understand that ministry is a teamwork. So if Paul is preaching, then someone else should be helping him by baptizing those who are new converts. And if you have been baptized before the person identified with you that you have received Jesus as Lord and Savior, then they don't care for your soul. Because the first thing we should do before anyone should do, before they baptize someone in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, they need to make sure that that person has repented of their sins and that they have received Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Because if they don't, all they're doing is causing that person to go down and come back up the same way that they went down. There is no change. So Paul is letting us know that baptism is secondary to the conversion process. He said you first, in other words, he's telling us that you first got to be saved before you are baptized. So the new letter, uh, new living translation says this for this particular verse. And I like this. It says, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And even my preaching sounds poor, for I do not fill my sermons with profound words and high sounding ideas for fear of diluting the mighty power there is in the simple message of the cross of Christ. So he's letting us know. He says, I don't add big words, big lofty words. I don't add all these things into the message that I preach because I don't want the message of Christ to get lost. I want to make sure that you understand understand the simple message of the cross of Christ. So he wants to make sure that when he preaches, everyone is able to understand that it is Christ Jesus and him crucified and not anything else that saves. So as a teacher who is teaching you God's word, if I did not love your soul, if I did not care about your salvation, I would not be telling you these things. So I'm telling you and I'm encouraging you that if you were baptized and have not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have not repented then your baptism is in vain. You must repent of your sins, ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, and after you have been converted, then comes the baptism process. Then you should be baptized after that and only after that. So Paul is saying not with wisdom of words, not with words that are going to puff you up, that's going to tickle your flesh, or words that try to make myself seem smarter or more intelligent or more spiritual. And that's what people are doing now. They're using these big words. They're trying to be so eloquent with their speech. They're trying to sound like they're more spiritual than they than they are, that they're putting all these words and you get so lost in these words, these big words, and trying to figure out what these words are that you miss that they miss the message 
They don't even tell you that Christ is all about Christ Jesus. They want you to see that they've got all of these degrees. They want you to see that they're supposed to be so smart, so intelligent. But yet they fail to tell you what the message of the cross is all about. So his preaching is not filled with material gain, but direction from the gospel for the salvation of one's soul. So that's what we have to be teaching and preaching that not for material gain, not from uh, to puff anyone up, not for societal gain, but to teach and preach the gospel that brings salvation for the soul. So Paul understood that if he preached with human wisdom, big and lofty words, that it would make the cross of Christ of no effect because people will be trying to receive salvation by their own accomplishments. And that's what we do not want to do. We do not want to give people the false hope that they can receive salvation by their own works, by their own intellect, by their own wealth, by their own strength. It only comes through faith in Christ Jesus. So, these people, these Corinthian believers, these this this town, see, they grew up being impressed with clever words, with an orator, which is a person that can speak so eloquently and so well that they could get lost in what the person is saying. So they grew up this way. They grew up under people that learned to debate. And Paul is letting them know, I don't want you to get caught up in that stuff. I want you to remember the simple message of the cross. So Paul is not speaking against those who carefully prepare what they want to say in their preaching or teaching. He's not saying that, but he's talking against those who try to impress others with their knowledge and their speaking ability. For you who just joined, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're at verse 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. So as we continue to study God's word, we're going to continue to see that Paul continues to declare God's word and wisdom and not human wisdom. And we're going to see that because he stayed on point, because he kept uh, Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ as his main focus, we're going to be able to see that God demonstrated through his Holy Spirit that he was pleased with the way Paul was delivering his word to the people, God's word, God's message to the people. So then verse 18, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, those who are dying, those who are headed to eternal damnation. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So to those who are heading to eternal damnation, those who are unbelieving, those who are living by human wisdom, those who are using their carnal mind to try to figure out this salvation uh, message and process, those who are walking in the world's philosophy and wisdom, these are the unbelievers. These are the ones that think that the cross is foolishness because the world says that it can't possibly be that easy. I've got to actually have to do something. It can't possibly be that easy to uh, receive salvation because in this time and age that we live in, you've got to do something in order to get something. So in order to get milk from the store, you've got to have some form of money or currency in order to get milk from the store. But then God says, come to me, all you, everyone. If you want milk, he says, come to me. If you want Whatever you need, he says, come to me. And he says, I give it to you freely because everything belongs to God. So when because God says that he gives it freely, people can't understand how can that possibly be. Everything that we are to obtain in this worldly world, to live in this world, we have to obtain by some type of avenue, either financial or educational or some kind of way, in order to get a certain job, you have to have so much education. In order to get a vehicle, you have to have the money, and so on and so forth. But then God says, I'm a lover of your soul. You come to me, and I will give you salvation. All you got to do is come in faith and believe and repent of your sin and, and receive my son as your Lord and Savior. So to us, who are being saved, that means it's a daily process. It is the power of God. It is 
God's power that is keeping us from going back out into the world. It is God's power that's, that's declaring to us what the scripture is saying. It is God's power, his spirit that is leading, guiding, and directing us. Then in verse 19, it says, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the, of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. So in Isaiah chapter uh, 29, verses 13 and 14, the Lord tells us, and this is a, a, a quote from there. It says, these people say they are mine. In other words, we can look at it as this. The people that are preaching, teaching, and leading people, these people say they are mine, God said. They honor me with their lips. They're saying with their lips all of these, these great words, but their hearts are far from me. People can fool us with their words, but they can never fool God because God is looking at their heart. Say, their hearts are far from me. And then he says, and their worship of me is nothing but man-made rules learned by rot, which means it's mechanical, it's habitual repetition repetition of something learned or something to be learned so god is saying i'm seeing these people i'm seeing them doing all these things in the churches or what have you but he's saying i'm watching their hearts i see what they're saying i see their actions i see all the dancing they're doing but it means nothing to me because they're not worshiping me the way i desire to be worshiped they got to worship me in spirit and in truth so because of the way that they're acting because of what they're doing God says, I'm not even impressed. He says, because of this, I will once again astound. That means he will render speechless these hypocrites. He said, they're hypocrites, they're frauds, they're phonies. He says, with, a, with an amazing, incredible, he says, I'm going to send wonders of miracles and surprises. He said, the wisdom of the wise will pass away. He said, these people that think they're wise, they have this intellectual ability, they have all this education. He said, the wisdom of these so-called wise will pass away. And then he said the intelligence, the intellect, the understanding of these so-called wise and smart people, he says it's going to eventually disappear. It's going to vanish away. So we got to make sure that we're not caught up in that. And in Matthew 15, you can write it down, 15, uh, 7 through 12, Write that down and you can go back and read it where Jesus talks about the hypocrites calling the Pharisees hypocrites or phonies because they are basically doing the same thing. So uh, Matthew 15, the verses 7 through 12, and also Mark chapter 7, verses 6 and 7. If for some reason you didn't get um, those scriptures, just let me know. Just contact me. Then it says in verse 20, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the spewer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? So I, even in Isaiah chapter 19, verse 12, it says, Where are the wise men now? Let them show you and make known that the Lord Almighty has planned against Egypt. So Isaiah said, well, why don't you show those people that are supposed to be so wise, call them forward and tell them, tell us what God has planned against Egypt. What has God got planned against Maryland, against the United States? What has God got planned against Virginia, wherever we are? What has God got planned against the United States of this world? He said, these people try to solve every problem with logic or debate. That's what he's saying when he's asking where the wise describe the disputer of this age. He said, these people try to solve with logic or debate. So these wise people he was talking about were the Greek philosophers. These are the ones that were supposed to be good thinkers. And then he says, well, where are the scribes? These are the clerks. These are the Jewish scholars. See, they were trained to handle details of the law. So he said, where are these people? Then he says, where is the disputer? That's the debater. That's the one that was trained in public speaking. He says, where are they now? Where are these people? Then he said, has not God, has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? So they can't come forth when it comes to God's word. Then in verse 21, it says, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. So God uses wisdom to prevent the world from finding or coming to him through human wisdom or human knowledge. See, 
we could not come to God and nobody can come to God with their own wisdom, with their own knowledge. It's only through the drawing of the Holy Spirit and it's only through faith that we believe in Jesus Christ and repent of our sins and then we receive salvation. So God only save, saves those who believe and receive his message of salvation, which the world calls foolish, the world calls silly. So we have to come to the Lord. You have to come to the Lord through God's plan, through God's way, and not of your own accord or your own way. So then verse 22, it says, For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews as a stumbling block and the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So verse 22, for Jews request a sign. What is these signs that the Jews were requested? The Jews wanted Jesus to prove that he was the Messiah. They wanted him to show them a sign that God had... Um, that God's promises of deliverance had begun, that he was beginning the process. They wanted Jesus to prove to them. In other words, do us a trick, show us a sign, do what we ask, and then we'll believe. In other words, that's what they were saying. Even the Pharisees in Mark 8, 11, they came, the Pharisees came to test Jesus and ask him for a sign from heaven. And then in John 6, 30, they asked him again, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? So in other words, if you don't show us, we won't believe you. Or if you want us to believe you, show us something. Show us a sign. So with the Greeks, they seek after wisdom. These Greek philosophers, they try to use their own wisdom to answer questions about God, to answer questions about life. Then in verse 23, Paul says, but we preach Christ crucified. This is what we preach. This is what this is the sign that you're going to receive, that we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, it's a stumbling block. To the Jews, Christ crucified is a stumbling block. Why? Because they had been taught that the Messiah was going to come as a conquering king, that he was going to be their political savior, that he was going to come. And this is what they were looking for him to come as. They wasn't looking for him to come as a suffering servant. They weren't looking for him to come and live among them, but they were looking for him to be in the palace. They were looking for him to come and take complete control of Jerusalem and the world. They were looking for him to come in a certain way. They were expecting him to restore uh, David's throne. And then when they saw him crucified as a common criminal, this became a stumbling block for them, for many of the Jews, because they couldn't understand with their natural minds the process that God was taking Jesus through. They couldn't understand the process of salvation. They couldn't understand why he was living the way he was living here on the earth. So they wanted a sign. They wanted to be shown something. But when Jesus went into the temple and he cleansed the temple, remember when he went in and they were selling um, stuff in the temple? They were doing everything in the temple, but making it or keeping it as a house of God, as a house of prayer for all people. They were doing all kinds of things. So when he came and he started purifying the temple, that was him showing us his messianic uh Ship, his messiahship. That was him showing us that he was the messiah when he declared that my father's house, this is my father's house, and this is not the way that it's supposed to be handled or treated. So they wanted him to show them a sign to prove he had the, what authority he had. And Jesus said in John 4 48, he says, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will be not, you will know means believe by no means will you believe so jesus already knew what type of people he was dealing with he already knew what type of hearts he was dealing with see the greeks think the cross is foolishness because they can't figure it out they can't make sense they can't use their natural minds their natural understanding to understand the cross to understand why things happen the way it happened with the world that we live in the world depends on power and influence and wealth 
wealth. As a result, many will not come to the cross because it doesn't make sense naturally. It doesn't make any natural sense. So then in verse 26, it for, says, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. So we got to take notice that God doesn't call people because they have degrees, because they have wealth, because they have social status. He doesn't call people like because of that. He calls the ones that he needs in the body to operate in the earth. He calls people regardless of their worldly or earthly status. He calls people from all social classes. He calls people from all ethnicities, including slaves. He calls the uneducated. He calls people with disabilities, people that some would count out. God has counted them in and has chosen them. Then in verse 27, it says, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised. God has chosen and the things which are not to bring nothing, the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. So thank you, Jesus. So salvation does not conform to the world's standards and the world's priorities eternal salvation is more valuable than fame is more valuable than wealth and success that this world pursues after in this society there were many slaves in corinth and by people by this being read and the listeners listening it would grab their attention that statement that says things which are despised by God has chosen things which are despised God has chosen so many of these slaves and these lower class people were looked down on and they were despised but Paul was letting them know that even you God has chosen see the very ones God have chosen the world looks down on even the things the world says are foolish has been chosen by God and that's why they are blinded they're spiritually blind that's why the Bible says they're forever learning and never coming into the knowledge of the truth why because they're trying to learn by their own intellect their own natural senses instead of allowing the spirit of the living God to lead God direct them and to teach them the things of God so salvation is for all classes and races of people. It only requires belief and faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Then he tells us that no flesh should glory in his presence, verse 29, because see, it is simple faith, not education, not skill, not strength, not wealth, not social status. None of these things is simple faith that we must have in Christ Jesus so that no one can say that they've achieved or they obtained salvation by their wealth, by their works, by their knowledge, by their ambition, by their strength. Nobody can say that. And God planned it this way so that nobody can boast. Nobody is going to take his glory. No one's intellectual ability, none of that can surpass God. So through faith in him, we can have and receive salvation. Then verse 30 says, But of him you are in Christ, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. So Jesus' life, his death, reveals God's wisdom. He tells us that if anyone likes wisdom, let them ask of God who gives generously to all without repro reproach and will, he will give it to him. James 1, 5, James 1, chapter, James chapter 1, verse 5. So for the Lord gives wisdom, from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He holds success in store for the upright. He is a shield to those whose walk is blameless. That's Proverbs chapter 2. Verses 6 and 7. Proverbs chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. That's the NIV, the New International Version. And then he says of righteousness. See, 2 Corinthians 5, 21 tells us God made him, God made who? Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. What is the righteousness of God? 
It is the behavior that is morally justifiable or right and is based on a, an acceptable standard. What standard? The standard of God's word. So we are made righteous in sight of God. That is that we are accepted. You and I as believers, as blood-bought believers, are accepted as righteousness and treated as righteous by God on account of what Jesus has done. Then we see sanctification. That is a process of being sanctified. That is a process of being dedicated, purified, or made holy when the truth of God's word is applied to your life. So that is sanctification. That is being sanctified. It's a daily process that we are being sanctified. And then we see redemption and redemption. It is the act of saving or being saved from sin. It's the act of being saved from error, from evil, from error or evil. And that comes through the plan of salvation. The plan of salvation is the work that Jesus did on the cross and through the way of the cross to redeem us from eternal damnation. So in conclusion, these church problems and division is a result of ignorance of God's word. Because of disagreements in which people lose focus of Jesus and his message, they lose focus of the unity that we're supposed to have. They lose focus of the love. They lose focus of not being they should not be selfish they lose focus of harmony they lose focus of trust and faith in him so we should all be followers of christ and not man we shouldn't put a pastor a bishop or another leader all up on a pedestal only christ jesus is supposed to be head of our life we should never put anybody in front of christ jesus there are still divisions as believers in the church. Believers still have, there's still divisions in the body of Christ because they're trying, people are trying to exalt themselves or they're trying to exalt their human leaders, their pastor, their bishop, the apostle, apostle or whoever. There's still immorality and disputes between believers that leads to bitterness and even lawsuits. There are people in the body of Christ that are suing other brethren or sisters in the body of Christ, suing other saints, which God says we should not be doing. There are even families that are breaking up and pastors and leaders are caught in sin. We're seeing this all the time. So these are some of the things that Paul is going to be continuously dealing with. There's misunderstanding of basic truth, which still raises doubt and uncertainties. uncertainties. So the lessons we should learn from this tonight is we need to be living a transformed life in Christ. Number two, many won't accept the gospel because of its simplicity. Because it's so simple, many people think it's foolish. Number three, we need to learn the scriptures ourselves. <coughs> Excuse me. We need to read, study, and apply the scriptures to our life. And that only comes through reading, studying, meditating, and asking God to help you. Number four, God gives wisdom to anyone who asks. To those who are trying to understand scripture with man's wisdom and knowledge, it will always fail every time. So we've got to walk in the spirit and the newness of mind that God gives us through Christ Jesus. And we got to focus our attention on God and the things that pertain to his kingdom. And then you won't trip or slip up in life and be caught up in immoral things of the world. Thank you, Lord. So if there's any questions...